they're getting close to the end of February and it's almost food plot planting time. And therefore, every year annually, I wonder how many more food plots fail than succeed. And that could be first time food plotters or you're playing the wrong thing or it just doesn't relate to your deer herd. And consistently, what I do, and I, I mentioned this over and over again, I know you guys uh, know that I've been to almost a thousand properties now in 27 states, 26 states right around there. And, um, and what I do is analyze what's currently working, what's failed, what's succeeded, what their history is. And often that boils down to a lot of the talk or the discussion boils down to food plots. And so basically what I do is analyze food plots for a living. And I do that times 26 states, times almost a thousand clients. You can't learn this stuff if you're only working on 40, 50 clients because you have to see this variety and you has, have to see the diversity that's spread out all across the country in terms of big ag, little ag, big woods, wilderness. Huge difference from one location to the next. But an overall, an overwhelming theme that I see across all food plot failures is the use of planting soybeans for deer. The soybean plantings and soybean food plots are by far, and it's not even close folks, the number one food plot failure that I see. At the same time, if you look up online and you look up some of the buzzwords for soybeans and planting soybeans for deer, it's also one of the talk, most talked about because there are some great attributes to soybeans. For example, in late August, early September, that's when there is a huge amount of deer that are hitting soybeans right before the leaves turn brown. Also, if soybeans are still standing in December and you have a very, very cold December, they will just hammer soybeans. They'll hit them religiously. And so those are some really good points about soybeans. And I'll mention, you know, I was going to point out these bucks right here, just the bucks right behind me in this group right here. And, and this extends all the way around the room here. I'm sure each one of these bucks, for the most part, except for that UP one, for this uh, Ohio one right over here, uh, but the rest of these from Wisconsin in this location, I might have a Pennsylvania one in here somewhere, but um, they were hitting soybeans during the summer and I'm sure they were a large percentage of their diet at some point or another during the summer. At the same time, that's one of the reasons you don't need to plant soybeans if they're in these areas. They're already feeding out on the manicured ag fields. They have that high protein diet that they can feed on all summer long. Soybeans are great when you have them, but boy, there are some very severe problems with, with soybeans that you need to go in to with your eyes wide open if you're going to plant soybeans this year. One of the biggest failures of soybeans right off the bat is that you just can't get them to grow till hunting season. Now, a lot of people say that, uh, you know, I don't really care about the deer during hunting season. It's not all about the hunt. I'm just trying to take care of the deer. Really, folks, did you buy your land just to take care of deer? That's, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, so if you, you're saying if you couldn't hunt, you wouldn't own that land. I, I don't think that's the case. You just bought it to take care of deer. But even then, if you need to plant soybeans or if you want to plant soybeans, you're going to need to plant on typical, on average, what I see is five to 10 acres. And if you're in northern settings where there's no other ag fields, no other crop fields within a mile to two miles or more, you're likely going to need to plant 10 acres plus just to even get some beans to the middle of the season. And that might mean that they don't even make it to the end of the season. So really think about high volume that you need uh, to plant to get those through. Now, if they're just lasting during the summertime and you're saying, well, those deer, the bucks, they're growing antlers, great for soybeans, great protein, um, nursing mothers, fawns, great to have those beans for those deer when they're growing during the summer times and think not. Because if you're in an area that already has beans, you're better off putting those deer in a, low, in a lower stress situation in big open ag fields than you are trying to jam them into your little food plots, even if they're five acres or two acres or one acre, whatever it is. And then at the same time, if you're putting those deer out in the ag fields, those are professionally manicured, high volume plots. You're just spreading the deer out. And if you put soybeans on your property, you're not giving them any more nutrition than they would have had otherwise on your land. So you're spending a lot of resources for those summertime when those deer can just filter out to somewhere else. Now, if you're in a big open woods in a wilderness area and you have to plant 10 acres plus and you get those beans to last till the middle of the season, even if you fence them off or whatever you do, then in those situations, are you creating a doe factory? Are the beans on your land creating a doe factory? And we'll talk about that in a second. The bottom line is you have to plant a lot of beans. If you're in a wilderness or woods setting five to 10 acres plus, and most of the time 10 acres or more, or you have to cage them, Cages work sometimes, sometimes they don't. Electric fences sometimes work, sometimes they don't. Even in ag areas, you have to plant a lot. And then often you're just in ag areas, 
offering more of the same that's surrounding in the, in the fields. And when you add in alfalfa in a lot of big ag areas and the production of alfalfa mixed with soybeans, you have the perfect combination to give deer everything that they need. You don't need to put it on your food plots and waste those resources. So let's talk about doe factories for a second. Uh, it's a huge problem across the entire country on a lot of times well-managed, quote, well-managed uh, deer parcels. When you place an excessive number of does and fawns on your land because you have high quality food sources during the summertime and you're already making great November and December cover choices and cover improvements where you have high stem count, that creates the perfect conditions for fawning. And those fawning areas are very highly competitive and does and fawns will come back to those areas year after year after year. And for that, you create a vacuum during the summertime where you're creating those perfect fawning conditions and you just keep attracting more and more and more deer. And that's a bad thing because those that are here today are here to stay. And so they carry over into the hunting season and they take up space. No, if you have a lot of does and fawns in your property, that is not the recipe for a great buck hunt during the fall. In fact, that couldn't be further from the truth. The old archaic way, caveman way of, of thinking was more does, more bucks. And that is a very, very false way to look at this overall in any setting. That is just absolutely not true. Does take up space, does and fawns take up space. You do not have mature bucks bedding with does and fawns. On a 40 acre parcel, 100 acre parcel, 300 acre parcel, it doesn't take much to supply a huge number of does and fawns on that parcel to the point where you just don't have any room left over for mature bucks, especially considering that not every parcel is just solid cover everywhere. And when you figure in access routes for hunters, for people during the summertime, areas where mature bucks do not want to live on your land, whether it's fall, summer, anytime, then you just don't have a lot of room when it comes to trying to hold mature bucks. And so if you have that summer food and you're place, placing a huge number of deer on that property during the summertime, you're going to push off bucks and that's going to spill over into the fall. And, and really what it boils down to, then you have a rut hunt property. And rut hunt properties are very poorly managed properties where you need to have the rut to shoot a doe. That's not saying much for your management or for your hunting practices. Good hunters, well-managed land will have bucks on their land starting late September, October, sometime in there, mid-October where they're on that land and then they're holding through December and January. If you need the rut those for two weeks in November to shoot a big buck, there's something wrong with your land. And a lot of times it boils back down to if you're planting beans and you have those summer food sources and you're putting too many does on, then you might have a certain number of bucks coming through during the rut because you have those does, but you're actually gonna have fewer bucks because there's not room there, so you don't have bucks that are already living there. So you're counting on bucks from, that live on someone else's property to travel a great distance onto your land during the rut. And really half the time during those rut, the rut, those bucks are staying back on their core areas on someone else's property. That's where they live the entire hunting season. So they don't just travel over to your land all the time during the rut. Think about it, they have a lot of other properties they can go to too. So I find that half the time they're in their core area and then a small percentage of time they might be on your land. And if they're used to not going on your property during the daylight, during the rest of the season, why can you expect them to be there during the rut? It happens occasionally, but a very poor property. And again, flip back to those beans during the summertime. That is number one cause for excessive doe numbers. And, and I see clients all the time that have a severe problem with this, where they make so many habitat improvements and they have such quality habitat improvements they attract more and more does. So even if they, let's say they have a number of 40 to 50 does and fawns on 200 acres, and they see that number every year, they shoot 10 of them or 15 of them. Even if they shot half of them, they still have that same number or more the next year because it creates a vacuum because they have such high quality fawning conditions during the summer. You're never gonna build a herd during the summer, folks. You're only gonna build a, a herd during the fall. That's the only time you can advance bucks in the next age class, attract them, hold them, protect them, shoot them if you want to, mold and shape sex ratios, buck age structures. You can only do that during the fall. You can't do that during the summertime. And if you have an excessive doe population because you're planting beans during the summertime, that is an epic failure uh, for that land in that situation. So those doe factories caused by summer food sources, whether they be soybeans, clover, alfalfa, or whatever it might be, the problem of doe factories and creating excessive doe populations to me far outweighs any positives that could be gained even if you grew five more inches on a four-year-old buck even if you put five more pounds on a on a doe 
during the summertime because you had better food sources. And a lot of times you have those little food plots on your property of two acres, five acres. You're pulling deer out of large areas that they could feed on during the summertime. The summertime is a, is a time of abundancy in the whitetail woods. And a lot of times you're sacrificing putting food out during the fall and winter when it's a time of leniency in the or uh, lean pickings in the in the whitetail woods uh, during the fall and winter months. So think about that with a doe factor. It's a serious concern and a lot of times soybeans are the number one cause. So even if those soybeans you say, well, they run out towards the end of summer, or they last in through mid hunting season, they still did their part. No, they didn't. They might have done a lot more harm than good. Soybeans by themselves are very incomplete. You think, well, they have a good summer draw. That's a bad thing usually. But during the summer, during the fall, even if you give them soybeans and they have that in the early season even if you have excessive amounts of deer then you have beans that they're eating on in october november usually that means you have a lot of deer you probably have excessive numbers of deer that were caused by the summer food sources being on the property and they're eating actual beans in october november that's not a good thing when they're doing so that means there's other factors either there's not enough food in the area they only have the beans but if you think about it beans are hard to digest just like corn just like acorns just like woody browse it's more roughage, it's not greens. Green should always be your base. So when you only have beans and you're relying on that, and I've even had people online say, well, we're waiting to the beans for December. It's gonna be a great hunt in December. Really? You only wanna attract deer during December? I mean, what about protecting them, holding them, advancing them to the next stage class? What about your rut? What about your early season? If you're putting all your eggs into one basket, you're just taking the leftovers in the, in the area. That's all you're taking. You're not taking the actual cream of the crop. You're not influencing the herd anywhere. Hunters are already out of the woods. And so if you're counting on December and your beans, you haven't done anything for the herd. You might be able to shoot a mature buck that comes from three miles away, but so what? You haven't influenced the herd. You're not a herd influencer. You're not a neighborhood influencer. And because of those beans and that's all you had, you're not really offering much to the local deer herd. So beans are very incomplete. In the, by themselves. No different than corn is very incomplete. No different than brassicas are very incomplete. You want to have a combination of all those and that combination needs to stretch to all your food plots. You can't have one portion of your property really hitting well during one portion of the season because you planted beans here, brassicas over there, corn in another spot, oats in another spot. You want all of those in one food plot. So you need to figure out, and I like stripping them out. You can look up 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, best food plot mix. And you see the mixes that I migrate to each year and, uh, and really use and rely on. And, uh, and I love planting late beans because that could be part of a green crop where you're trying to get green leaves all the way into November. But beans by themselves are very, very incomplete and they'll leave your land and your herd very incomplete and we do when you don't have solid food sources in August and September that extend all the way into January or February then you lose your ability to influence anything in the neighborhood influence your hunt improve the herd or anything because you're just looking at a very micro part-time herd during the hunting season managing a part-time herd as it relates to 365 days a year is awesome because then you can look at well I'm managing deer for four months during the hunting season that's when I'm peaking that's when my property is peaking. But folks, if your property is peaking in March, you didn't do a thing. If your property is peaking in July or June or August, you didn't do a thing at all. Now, another really big negative of beans is often you need to open the earth. And if you're not working on the earth, you're not tilling, you're not disking, you're not working those beans in a little bit. Now, true, everyone has great luck. You know, one out of 10 years, they can throw some beans on the soil. You get a lot of rain for two weeks, you get good germination. But that doesn't happen very often. You can't count on that at all. In fact, you'll fail 90% of the time if that's the way you're planting beans, just throwing them on open soil, even if that soil's been chemically treated and controlled for weeds. Those beans need to be covered up a little bit. So that means breaking open the soil, drying out the soil, and really hurting the soil as it relates to tilling and deep tilling and bringing up weed seeds and drying out the soil. and so then that takes the next step of, of no-till drilling. Well, if you're no-till drilling, that means you have big tractors and big equipment, expensive equipment. Now, I like some of the no-till drills. We used the, the RTP in the past, uh, RTP Genesis in the past. That was a pretty cool little no-till drill. It's pretty easy to plant beans with. We did, uh, did so. We pushed them down about two inches deep and, uh, and they found moist ground and, and germinated really well without even having some rain. But those machines are 10,000 plus, 15,000, 18,000. And then the tractor that you need or the machine that you need to pull them, you know, at minimum 15 to 20,000, but typically you're in the 40, 50, 60 if you're using a Genesis 8. 
I believe it's 60 to 80 horsepower you're gonna want. And so you're looking at a 60 to $80,000 tra tractor plus. So really heavy equipment to get those beans in or you're paying someone to do it. So that's a real negative and something that's not available to a lot of people. So I see people just throwing beans on the soil because they find something online that says, yeah, they'll grow if you get a lot of rain. Well, again, you're gonna fail 90% of the time with that or you're gonna need some really expensive equipment to plant those beans. And, and in my eye, there's a lot better ways to get it done. And that's, that's also a failure as it relates to soybeans. Now I'll leave you with this. You know, soybeans, typically, I rarely see when someone's planting one, two, three acres, and I've seen it down to a quarter acre or less, where typically those beans are not making it to hunting season. And even if you plant something else, your food plot system has already failed for the entire year because you probably contributed too, too many does during the summertime. You contributed to a potential doe factory and you really didn't do anything for influencing the herd, creating health for the herd in any way. And you're having to replant again and spend a lot more money. Those beans are expensive. Um, and that's another thing, planting beans, buying beans. If you look at some of the uh, hunting marketed beans out there, they're extremely expensive compared to other quality seeds and other quality choices. So planting those beans, creating a dough factory, having those beans not make it into the hunting season, all very bad. If you have to buy an expensive fence, and, and even then a lot of times people are fencing and then they're taking the fences off, and I've seen this with brassica too, because brassica is another one that can't tolerate a lot of browse. Or they're taking down the fence and in two weeks it's gone. So that didn't do you any good either. You didn't establish a pattern of use in the early season with food sources. And so I'll leave you with this with beans. Beans can be a great complement if you need to build your herd numbers uh, to an otherwise really sound food plot program. You always look at greens as a base. Greens meaning late planted peas, meaning August 1st planted in most areas, August 15th, maybe the end of July up north. But you're looking at an excessive number of peas, 100 pounds per acre or more. 25 to 50 pounds of soybeans can be included in that mix and that's what I really like because then you're not, I'm not counting on a bean, I'm counting on greens taking place and staying around all the way through first part of November. They're a complement to the peas, they'll stick around to the end of November. Then I'm top dressing that with rye on that half of the plot. So that's all going into one, one side of the plot and usually I'm using 200 pounds of rye. So we're looking at 350 to 400 pounds of seed on that one side layered so that you have a lot of green. The other half of the plot I really like using a lot of brassicas. Um, but it could be you have the greens on one side, you even leave out the brassica and maybe you replace it with corn. So corn is that second level of the food plot pyramid. And finally that third level, if you want to actually draw deer to new food plots, if you're trying to increase the overall population, then you add those beans as that top point of the triangle. And then they can be appropriate at that time. They can be a really powerful time. And that's where if you have that carryover in December and you have those beans standing, but I've seen even to December, I've seen 45 deer on a parcel one spring, late winter, where deer were attracted to those beans. And I've seen on that same property, because there was a mild winter, that those beans rotted in the spring because the deer didn't move out of their fall ranges. They didn't have to go eat those beans. It's a lot different. I look at greens, they eat them because I love them. They eat them because they need to wash down the browse and twigs and sticks and briars and acorns, beans and corn that they feed on, and they need to wash it all down with those greens. So the greens are so critical to wash down the beans, the corn, the acorns, the browse, the briars during the daylight hours. And then you have that corn. And what I find, even corn compared to beans, beans can be that incredible draw. Again, during December and late season, if it's extremely cold. But I find, again, deer love those greens. They want to eat them. And that's what they prefer. If they could eat a lot of greens during the middle of winter, they would. There are high moisture requirements, easy to digest. Often they need the greens to wash down everything else. And then corn, I find that they eat corn because they want to eat corn. Um, they need those carbs. And so a lot of times, even if just you're getting normal winter temperatures, normal late November, December, they'll hit that corn. I find beans though, they eat them when they have to. And they, not necessarily because they want to, not necessarily because they need them, that that's what they're attracted to greatly. It's because they have to. And that's why on some properties, they'll eat them really heavily in December when it's cold. But on another year when it's not cold in December and January, even November, you'll see those beans rotting in the field in those same conditions. And you can see that from one year to, to the next. So think about beans. I want, guys see, I want to see you guys succeed. I want to see you have great food plots. Again, that's what I do is analyze food plots for a living. And there's always a balance you're trying to achieve. I'm not saying that there's not times for beans out there, but there's not as many times for beans 
as people think, often beans are the first thing people think and dream about planting. And folks, it should be the last thing that you're thinking about because if you're focusing on beans first, you're not prioritizing what actually deer need in your area. And you could be doing, in a lot of cases, and I see this with beans probably 50% of the time, people are doing more damage than good when they're planting those beans on their food plots as it relates to creating a herd, building a herd, and having a great herd to hunt in the fall. I really want you to avoid food plot failures. Soybeans by far, and is not even close, are the number one food plot failure that I see around the country. And I hope that if you plant them this year, you go in to your planting with eyes wide open because you are setting yourself up for failure often. Think about these aspects of planting beans. I hope I covered it enough. If you look up uh, soybeans for whitetails, you'll find my articles. I even have some articles on no-till soy, soybeans that I first published years ago telling people how to take soybeans, putting them into standing rye or standing wheat, and then spraying and rolling that over the call the packer. You can do that. You can plant soybeans like that. I first originated that many years ago, and that's something that goes along with my buckwheat plantings and the ultimate no-till. So you can do that, but again, ask yourself, do I really need to plant soybeans this year? And for 90% of you out there, you're going to find the answer is a resounding N-O.